Hello everyone, I'm Nalin. I'm Ng Tong. Uh, and today we're going to talk about recursive ZK snarks, um, the kinds of applications they unlock, um, and how we can implement them. So first we should talk about what recursive proofs even are. Um, so in the context of snark, recursion is usually the ability to verify a snark proof inside of another snark proof. So this is the ability to say something like, I know a snark proof uh, that when I run the snark verification algorithm on, it returns true inside of another snark proof. Um, and the sort of key part here is that verification of recursive ZK snarks is usually not significantly slower than ordinary um, regular ZK snark verification. So now that we have this primitive in mind, we should think about the sort of natural question is why would you want to make recursive snark proofs? So typically regular ZK snarks, you know, we think of them as having two uh, sort of properties, succinctness and zero knowledge. So recursion in fact unlocks powerful versions of both of these properties um, in the form of compression, which is a stronger version of succinctness, and multi-party composability um, from zero knowledge. So first, let's talk about compression. We think of compression as supercharging succinctness, um, and in particular, usually the applications of compression tend to share a sort of common pattern. Um, and this common pattern looks like, you know, let's say we have a prover who wants to show a verifier um, some n pieces of knowledge. How do they do this? Um, they make a proof showing uh, two sort of things. First, they show one piece of knowledge, um, and then they also show, you know, additionally the n minus one other pieces of knowledge. But for these n minus one pieces, um, instead of showing each piece individually, they will show that they know a another snark proof of uh, these n minus one pieces. So the next question is, how do you make the snark proof for the n minus one pieces of knowledge? Um, and in fact, we use the same kind of strategy again. Um, the n minus one pieces of knowledge, we show one piece of knowledge, and additionally we show that we know another proof of n minus two pieces of knowledge. Um, and so then, you know, you just cascade down this sort of strategy and you end up with this situation where you're verifying uh, one uh, snark uh, proof and in that uh, it's automatically verifying these n items of knowledge. Um, another instance of compression that's particularly helpful to point out um, is uh, the setting where you want uh, to compose between different proof systems or arithmetizations and um, at the time uh, also pick the good features of each of them. So for instance, you can have some setting where you have two different proving schemes, one where you have a fast prover, but unfortunately the verifier is slow, um, and another where the prover is slower, but uh, you get the trade-off that the verifier is fast. So using recursion, you can compose between the proving system from the wider setting to the narrower setting and get a tiny proof output as well as fast prover getting sort of the best of the both worlds. Um, a concrete sort of instantiation of this interoperability is the setting with Starks and Grot16. Um, in particular, Grot16 uh, is very uh, cheap to verify, whereas Starks are very easy to prove. So if you verify a Stark proof inside of a Grot16 snark, you end up with a proof of the original statement with a fast prover as well as a fast verifier. So generally compression has this sort of property that is very mechanical um, and usually you're rolling up some giant list of computation or um, items of knowledge um, incrementally into a single proof. Uh, so just to give a flavor for sort of what applications this unlocks, um, let's look at things that are interesting to roll up. Um, so first is signatures. Um, it, over the summer we built applications using sort of this primitive of recursive uh, compression of signatures called isocratia, um, where we end up with a low trust, low cost sort of uh, roll up of off-chain votes um, and end up securing governance. And then more related to sort of blockchain land, um, you can do the same kind of trick with uh, light client proofs. Um, and in fact, Plumo, uh, which is Solo's uh, light client, is based on this sort of idea. And there's also another group um, named Axiom, which is exploring sort of more um, cooler use cases for this with aggregating and uh, providing historical data um, through the use of recursive snarks. Um, and then finally, the sort of hot topic in blockchain land these days is making rollups of transactions. Um, two particular ones that are sort of interesting to point out are uh, Mina, who sort of used this recursion um, primitive as a consensus layer primitive, um, and Polygon Hermes, who used the exact strategy of like uh, using Starks uh, for fast prover settings and uh, Grad16 or Snarks for uh, fast verification settings.
Next, uh, let's talk about composability, my personal favorite property uh, unlocked by recursive snarks. Um, so to give some context for this, let's take a step back. Um, let's think about what uh, a normal ZK proof, uh, you know, what, what's the context of a normal ZK proof? We usually think of, you know, ZK proofs in this context where a prover is showing knowledge to a verifier um, without revealing the underlying fact of the knowledge. With recursion, in fact, um, you can unlock something more powerful. Uh, a prover can show knowledge to a verifier without fully knowing the underlying facts themselves. So this is a bit hard to model, so I'll just lead with an example. Um, over the summer, we built this application called EatDOS, um, which is Erdosh numbers on social graphs. So these social graphs are sort of graphs of uh, relationships of uh, people saying, I am your friend kinds of things. Um, and for instance, here we have this graph, um, and Vitalik sent someone, who sent someone, who sent someone, and finally uh, I ended up with uh, a four degree path to Vitalik. Now I can prove that I have a four degree path to Vitalik uh, without revealing any, or without knowing any of the intermediate uh, parties in this path. So how do I do this? Um, I say, uh, I am a friend of Adhyan, um, and Adhyan has a ZK proof that he is three degrees from Vitalik. So in this process, I do not know the three degrees that precede Adyan, and I have still convinced any external, as well as myself, that there is a valid path of four degree between me and Vitalik. So of course, this is not the only application you can build. Um, in general, we think composability is particularly cool to think of in uh, sort of incomplete information game kinds of settings. Um, and uh, of course, the, the sort of very typical example, the, the very starting point we thought of was uh, games like Telephone or Chinese Whispers, where you, know, you pass a word around or something and you want to make edits to it uh, incrementally. And then you can make more complex applications, um, like m party games like Mafia, those kinds of things. Um, and then more relevant to blockchain land, you can build private state channels and um, roll-ups of that sort. So now that we have some intuition for the high-level properties of recursive proofs, and now that we've seen some classes of applications that are enabled by them, you might be feeling that recursive proofs are kind of unreasonable. Um, we get unlimited compression and composability. So I guess the natural question now is how do we implement and construct these systems? So right now there's broadly three classes of recursive proofs in production. And as we descend the hierarchy, we are relaxing the requirements on the proof systems um, which are eligible for um, recursive schemes. So at the very top of the hierarchy, we have really the most stringent requirements. So we, we need proof systems with verifiers that are sublinear, that are succinct in the size of the statement being proven. And this enables us to do full recursion at every recursive step. So this has been implemented for the Groth 16 and Fry um, proof systems. So if we relax our requirements a little bit um, and we say even if we don't have a succinct verifier, maybe we're happy enough just with a succinct accumulator. So intuitively what this means is that we want a verifier with this shape um, that they have a succinct check, a cheap check, and then separately they have an expensive check. And so here we can instantiate an atomic accumulator and at each recursive step we only perform the succinct checks. And um, we accumulate the expensive check and delay checking it until the end of a, a long batch of proofs. And doing this gives us um, amortization of the expensive check. And finally if we relax even more, um, we don't even require a succinct accumulator. Well, now we're just happy with a succinct public accumulator. Um, and the idea behind this split accumulation is simply that you split your accumulator into a public and private part. And the public part is short, and this is what we accumulate at each recursive step. Um, where, whereas we delay the verification of the private part of the accumulator um, until the very end. So 
let's go through um, these constructions at a high level, one by one, just so you can see the shape of it. So probably the cleanest shape is, oh, the, the cleanest shape would be full recursion. So over here we start with our application circuit and it's F, um, F of WIZI -I gives you ZI plus one, right? It's a normal relation. Now, we bundle that together with a recursive verifier and um, basically this recursive verifier takes in a proof instance that was produced by the previous instance of the recursive circuit. And so if, if we look forward, we, we need to generate a proof of the whole recursive circuit in order to input to the next recursive instance. So in this way, we're chaining recursive circuits. And at each step, we are fully verifying the previous instance. And when we get to the final verifier, um, we no longer need to bundle it with the application circuit. And here, we can just perform a final verification of the proof outside the circuit. So this is full recursion. It's, it's the cleanest API. Um, now, we're going to get slightly more messy, and we're going to relax our requirements um, to get an atomic accumulation scheme. So now, if you recall here, in an atomic accumulation scheme, our verifier is not sublinear. So in fact, um, the verifier inside the recursive circuit is just the accumulation verifier, and it only concerns itself with the succinct checks of the verifier. Um, and the expensive check is accumulated and deferred um, at each step. So here we are chaining basically instances of proofs and accumulators. Um, and at each step, we're just procrastinating on performing the expensive check. Well, until we're finally satisfied at the end of a long chain of proofs, um, we perform the final decider um, sub protocol that finally bites the bullet and does the linear time check. Um, but at this point, we can do it outside the circuit. And at this point, the cost of the linear time check is amortized across a big batch of proofs. Now, from here to atomic accumulation is uh, just a small step. So it's just splitting up your accumulator and your proof instance into a public and private part. And now the verifier, the recursive verifier gets even smaller and it concerns itself only with accumulating the instances, the public parts, um, and it does not perform, it does not have access to the private parts of the accumulator and rather it relies on the prover to provide some commitments to the private parts um, which it then performs um, accumulator checks on. So a lot of these constructions I've described are really cutting edge and they come from a feature of our modern proof systems that are very modular in design. And as we get a better understanding of the building blocks um, and the components of our proof systems, this lets us customize our proving stacks a, with a lot finer granularity. And recursion, as we saw, also allows us to compose proof systems and to get the best of both worlds in many cases. So here's an example of a modular conception of a proof system. So I work on um, the proof system Halo 2. And I think of Halo 2 um, in terms of these four components. So at the very front end is where you're interfacing with your business logic. So you take a relation and you arithmetize it into, um, so in, in Halo 2's case, we encode our values in the Lagrange basis and we encode constraints on these values as polynomial identities. We then input these polynomials into this information theoretic um, polynomial IOP um, that basically checks the correctness and the consistency of um, the polynomials encoding our circuit. 
And then we realize this um, polynomial IOP using a cryptographic compiler. So in this case, it's the inner product argument that and the fiat Shamir transform that allows the prover to define their interaction with the verifier. And at the very end of it, um, Halo 2 is a recursive proof system and we can in fact instantiate an atomic accumulator over the inner product argument. So these are the four sort of modular pieces of modern proof systems that I think of. Now, we can do pretty funny things um, composing these pieces. So I've thought of three cases. Um, so the first one is information theoretic compilers. Um, and an example of this is MPC in the head. Um, what this does is it converts one information theoretic protocol to another one. And in this case, um, it's the prover sort of pretending to run a multi-party computation in, in her head. Um, so she's really simulating the multiple views in an MPC and committing to those views. And now the verifier is only checking the outer protocol, being the MPC, instead of checking the inner protocol, which is the ZK proof. So this is one very interesting way uh, to compose proof systems. Another way that we've seen before in this presentation is more or less just implementing verifier X in prover Y. And you would do this also for efficiency gains. And um, sort of the last class of composition that I came up with was really just thinking up better cryptographic compilers. So there's this recent paper by a group at Consensus. Um, and they, they took this protocol, GKR, that's um, highly optimized for re repetitive computations like hash functions. Now, but the problem with GKR is that it has a slow verifier. And um, so, and it also uses the Fiat Shamir hash as a cryptographic compiler. And this makes it very inefficient in the context of recursion. So what the team at Consensus did was they came up with their own um, cryptographic compiler that was custom made for their target proof system. And the target proof system here is like a Groth 16 R1CS um, proof, proof system. And so really like that's going in the middle and making changes, like customizing proof systems at a very low level um, for efficiency. And uh, yeah, I think this, this leads me to ask um, whether or not we can systematize this process and um, whether or not we can, I don't know, um, explore this optimization space in a well-defined way. So you can think of this as kind of a call to action. Um, so I think there's certain nice to have, certain to-dos that all proof system implementers would really like. The first being good benchmarks, fair benchmarks of heavily used primitives like hash functions, like big int arithmetic. So benchmarks of these primitives across different proving stacks. And the second would be it's a kind of a meta requirement is to think of like what metrics we're interested in. For example, efficiency, for example, proof size, um, and basically how to optimize towards these metrics. So on what basis are we comparing different compositions and configurations? And the last sort of call to action would be to think carefully about how security properties also compose, like, excuse me, like is it the least secure proof system, the, the fewest bits of security or like some weird composition when we mix and match proof systems? So all these are questions that it would be great to have everyone's input on. Like even this taxonomy that I came up with, I'm not sure that it captures um, all features of proof systems 
in the best way. So Nalan and I actually help out at um, a group called Xerox Park. Oh, we didn't put the name on the slide. It's Zero X Park. Um, and we're setting up this task force to look into this area of uh, recursion, aggregation, and composition. Um, yeah, and I think like I might as well take this opportunity to shout out Xerox Park. Uh, they supported a lot of our work, a lot of those fun apps, and a lot of these community efforts. Yeah, I think that is all I have. So, thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We have time for one or two questions. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. We got a question here on this side. Hi. Um, I, I didn't think this would work for years and years and years. Um, and I also, I'm not, I'm not even sure that it does work. It does seem way too good to be true. So can you prove, and how do you prove that, that it's secure to do recursive like, proofs like this? Like, where, where is the security proof? You know, I don't know how to convince myself that this works actually. Yeah, I mean, that is a good question. It seems very unreasonable that you can prove like an arbitrarily long history of computation with a constant size proof. Um, it does seem unreasonable. So I will say that security proofs exist there in papers. Um, but Nalan, do you have like some intuition as to why the security should hold? Uh, yeah, for sure. I, I, I think one uh, sort of physics based view that we've seen before is like, it's like, oh, you have 3D uh, space and you're collapsing it to like a 2D surface. Um, I forget the exact name of this, but. The holographic uh, principle. There you go. Uh, so I, I, I think there is like some sort of meta justification you can come up with to convince yourself if that's like the sort of thing, but uh, there is proofs of all kind that are actually substantial. It's a good question. Any other last minute questions? We have one at the back all the way over there. So recursive proofs are real fun, but if you do it at scale, then you're, you know, it's like you, 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 you have Scylla and Charybdis snapping at your heels uh, because of the proof carrying data, right? If you want to build on recursive proofs and it doesn't happen at the same time, so let's say you do a, a proof and you do a recursive proof, and then you have to wait for a state change for something else that might happen much later. You need to keep the proof carrying data around. And as you know, if, as you know, but most here, that is typically a very large amount of data. Um, so it's like if you're doing it at scale, you're really running into the issues of data provisioning and um, all the fun part can get really expensive really, really quickly, not even talking about like the, the um, you know, the, the, the computational overhead that you have. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think, I don't think recursive proofs are a silver bullet and I think they're better suited for some shapes of applications. So recursive proofs are very commonly used to reduce prover space complexity. So breaking up a large circuit into many smaller parallelizable circuits. So yeah, but I, I agree like in context of applications with more complicated and like timely data flows, it's, it's, we have to put some care into how and where we are inserting this proof carrying data. Yeah. Right, and also just to add, uh, I, I think there's also some interesting like sort of clean separation here of like rules versus data availability sort of problems. Um, and if you just look at, you know, data availability as a sort of black box problem, you know, you have lots of blockchain kinds of solutions for it. And for instance, Isocratia explores um, one sort of solution that um, maybe you can check out the blog on. Yeah, also to add on to that, like I, th I really like Nalan's thing about composability, the fact that, um, you know, you, it, in, you can play incomplete information games. So I think sort of fun applications like that that are unique to PCD are also very interesting to explore. Amazing. That's all the time we have for today. Please give Ian and Nalin a big round of applause.